Tonight, a summer of discontent on the railways. Striking signal workers will wipe out almost all of ScotRail services for three days next week. We depend on the trains to get to work, so the strike happens to happen on a Saturday, so that's going to upset us. It's just it's a nightmare, but there's what can you do, really? <laughs> Passengers are being told not to travel. Also making the headlines, yes or no. What do younger voters think as the Scottish government names its preferred date for IndyRef 2, October next year? Bring me sunshine. Glasgow's cabbies head to Ayrshire, giving hundreds of children with additional needs a grand day out. And in sports, Scotland boss Steve Clark says he'll learn the lessons of their tough summer to come back stronger. I'm Kellyanne Woodland in Edinburgh. And I'm John Mackay in Glasgow. This is the STV News at six. Good evening. Commuters are bracing themselves for a difficult week ahead as the rail union RMT says it's now almost certain industrial action will go ahead. Railway workers will walk out on three days next week over an ongoing dispute about pay and budget cuts. Just 11% of ScotRail services will be running, leaving many commuters struggling to get to work. Well, Caroline Lewis is at Glasgow Central for us now. And Caroline, what's the latest? Well, I think hopes that a resolution is going to be found before next week are fading fast. And the full details of what this is going to mean for commuters were revealed today. On Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday next week, across Scotland, just five services will be running. And they'll all be in the central belt. And those services will only be running between half seven in the morning and half past six in the evening. So for rail users, it's definitely going to be a challenging week. Reduced services and timetables. Just a fraction of ScotRail trains will be in operation during industrial action next week, which means many commuters are having to rethink their plans. Work in security, so we depend on the trains to get to work. So the strike happens to happen on a Saturday, so that's going to upset us. There's no way really to get in and out of our area without a train or a bus. Still got to try and get into work no matter what because everyone still needs to get a paycheck at the end of the week. So it's, it's a nightmare, but there's, what can you do? On strike days, just five routes will be in operation in central Scotland. These are Edinburgh to Glasgow via Falkirk High, Edinburgh to Glasgow via Shots, Edinburgh to Bathgate, Glasgow to Hamilton and Glasgow to Lanark. Some west and east coast cross-border trains will also be in operation, but at a reduced timetable, leaving much of Scotland without any services at all. We are working hard to run as many trains as we can for customers. However, it will be a very limited service, limited to a few routes in the central belt and on cross-border services. And we're urging passengers to check before they travel and to consider their journey and what alternative transport may be available to them. So as the 21st looms ever closer, next week could signal the start of a summer of misery for travellers. Well, that's the important point. This could only be the beginning. While we're only looking at three days strike action at the moment, I spoke to an r and rep representative earlier today, and they've said that if an agreement can't be found with Network Rail by the end of that three days strike action, they will be planning more in the weeks and months ahead. So potentially a long and difficult summer ahead for commuters. But as for next week, uh, uh, pa rail passengers are being told to avoid rail transport if they can, uh, find alternative methods of travel, and to check that your trains are running before you head to the station. Caroline, Glasgow Central, thank you. Health union leaders are warning that a 5% pay offer from the Scottish Government is not enough. The Health Secretary says it's a record-breaking offer which will cost more than £300 million. Unions representing 160,000 nurses, paramedics, porters and other NHS staff will put the offer to a member's vote. Experienced porters will see a thousand pounds more in their pocket uh, over the course of the year. Uh, nurses over sixteen hundred pounds. Advanced nurse practitioners 
over two, to almost two and a half thousand pounds uh, additional uh, if they accept uh, this deal. Uh, so look, we're going to have to, to manage that within our budget and we're confident uh, that we're able to do that. The members can see that actually it is a pay cut because they've had years over the past 10 years that has been a pay cut that we have and our take home pay is just not meeting the cost of living. So it's difficult to say how members will react, but it will be up to the members to decide. The man who made a sexual harassment complaint against the SNP MP Patrick Grady says his life has been made a living hell. Mr Grady faces a two-day suspension from the Commons after being found to have breached Parliament's sexual misconduct rules. The man he targeted, who was 19 at the time, says it's not enough and Mr Grady should quit. He has accused the party of trying to protect their former chief whip and making him feel it was his fault. The First Minister has apologised and says the party will reflect on how complaints are dealt with in the future. Our Westminster correspondent Catherine Sampson reports. It's been a living hell, really, um, and it's turned my world upside down. Six years ago, this man attended an SNP social event at a pub in London while working for the party. He was 19 at the time. Patrick Grady was a 36-year-old MP. He had perched himself on the side of the couch I was sitting on, on the arm of the chair. Um, and, you know, he started putting his fingers down the back of my neck uh, quite forcefully. Um, and he did this for quite a prolonged period. I'd, I'd never had this attention from a man before, so I just froze up. Um, but, yeah, there was people there that saw it. Yesterday, Patrick Grady was judged by an independent panel to have breached Parliament's sexual misconduct policy. He faces being suspended from the House for two days and was told to make this public apology. I apologise to the complainant without reservation for my behaviour and for the distress and upset it has caused him. Since the incident in 2016, I have participated in bespoke and generic training, which has helped me to reflect more fully on my behaviour, its impact on others and the steps I must take to ensure it is not repeated. Um, I don't accept the apology. It's not genuine. Um, he's only made the apology because he's been ordered to, um, in order to keep his job. He says Patrick Grady should quit as an MP and a two-day suspension sends the wrong message. Very weak, um, and it shows that there's actually not a zero tolerance to sexual harassment. There is a level of tolerance that will be accepted. In recent months, there's been a series of sexual misconduct claims at Westminster... The Tory MP Neil Parrish quit in May after admitting watching porn in the Commons. He was suspended from the party while under investigation. His colleague David Warburton is suspended while sexual harassment claims against him are looked into. Patrick Grady wasn't suspended while under investigation and will return to Parliament. I'm, I'm currently in a situation where I'm going to have to return to work and face the guy that harassed me, potentially on a daily basis, which is what I was trying to avoid. Um, and, you know, I didn't make the complaint for so long because I thought that I might have been ostracised, I would have been moved out of my role, that my career would have derailed and my life would have derailed. And that is exactly what ended up happening. It hurts and it's confusing as well. It's very confusing because it doesn't match up with what the message seems to be everywhere else. It certainly feels like uh, the SNP um, are, want to protect Patrick and support Patrick rather than support the victim. The SNP will reflect carefully on the comments of this complainer and if we need to change uh, processes that are in place to make them robust. One of the things that is so important here is that when people suffer this kind of behaviour and we all wish that that didn't happen, that the process they go through should not make the experience or the trauma uh, that they have suffered worse. Stories of sexual harassment continue to cast clouds over politics, adding to calls for a cultural shake-up. Catherine Sampson, SCB News. October 2023, that's the date the Scottish Government plans to hold a second independence referendum. The First Minister is expected to set out a route map on how that might happen in the coming weeks. It comes a day after Nicola Sturgeon launched a refreshed campaign for independence. However, the UK government continues to insist now is not the time for another vote. Here's our political correspondent, Ewan Petrie. Now we start with questions to Prime Minister. These pupils are keeping a keen eye on the latest twists and turns in the debate over Scotland's future. Yesterday, our First Minister started a national conversation. On the Scottish Government has now said that conversation will lead to a vote in October next year. But it's already got people talking. 
including those who would be voting for the first time. I'd really like to see an independent Scotland and I really would like to have another referendum. Um, but I'm not 100% convinced that right now would be the perfect time to have it. Rather than the government campaigning for an independence referendum, they should be thinking about like the rising cost of living and things like that. Time and time again, the Scottish people can prove that there is a pro-independence majority and there is a desire for another referendum and not be given it. I believe that at a certain point that has to become anti-democratic. I don't think uh, the country is financially stable enough. You know, we'll lose the Barnett formula and uh, have full fiscal autonomy. I don't think it's a great idea. Do you have black food? Yeah, yeah, yeah. However, the SNP claims Scotland is being held back by Westminster. And now, a threat of a trade war with our European friends, triggered by a law-breaking Prime Minister. That is not a vision for the future of Scotland. Our nation is big enough rich enough and smart enough. Isn't it the case, Prime Minister, that Scotland simply can't afford to remain trapped in the failing Westminster system? The UK has uh, record numbers of people in uh, payroll employment. That's an an astounding thing uh, when you consider where we were during the pandemic. That was because of the UK working well together, as he will remember, with the vaccine rollout. He talks about a a, a trade war. What could be more foolish, Mr Speaker, than a project that actually envisages trade barriers uh, within parts of the United Kingdom? That's what we're trying to break down. This is just the start of the conversation. The First Minister has promised to set out in the coming weeks exactly how a referendum will be delivered. These first-time voters will be among those looking for answers. Ewan Petrie, STV News. A married GP who raped a student nurse after meeting her on the dating app Tinder is beginning a four-year jail sentence tonight. Dr Manesh Gill from Edinburgh attacked his victim at a hotel in Stirling. Today, a judge at the High Court in Edinburgh described the 39-year-old's treatment of his victim as distressing and frightening encounter. Our senior reporter Gordon Cree was in court. Dr Manesh Gill came to court today carrying an overnight bag, knowing the outcome was inevitable. Are you ready for jail, Dr Gill? He was sentenced to four years today after being found guilty at a trial last month. He could have pled guilty instead. He's put her through the ordeal of having to go through this trial. But I think the positive here is the message this sends to anybody out there who is thinking of engaging in predatory behaviour using apps like Tinder is that there will be very serious consequences. That that this behaviour is rape and the justice system takes it very seriously. The attack happened in December 2018 at a hotel in Stirling. The woman, who's now 23, had met Gill there for drinks. They'd been chatting online for several weeks after he super-liked her profile on Tinder. At Gill's trial, the woman said he poured her a really strong pink gin and her body began to shut down as he attacked her. He was on top of me. I was trying to push him off. I couldn't. I just felt like my whole body was stuck to the bed. He was having sex with me. I wanted to go home. I felt as if I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything. The judge, Lord Tyre, described what Gill had subjected his victim to as a distressing and frightening encounter. He told him that society rightly regards the crime of rape as one of the most serious that can be committed and that a custodial sentence could be the only outcome. Gill's name is being added to the sex offenders register, while prosecutors have praised his victim's bravery in coming forward. Gordon Cree, STV News, Edinburgh. Other stories across Scotland now. And five people were taken to hospital with smoke inhalation following a fire at a tenement stairwell in Edinburgh. Five fire engines were dispatched to Leith Walk after the alarm was raised around half past two this morning. A dog rescued by firefighters was given oxygen at the scene. The Scottish and UK governments were ill-prepared for a pandemic, according to a report for the Scottish COVID inquiry. Other research into the response to the virus highlights discrimination against care home residents and says severe restrictions likely contributed to some patients' decline and even death. An avian flu outbreak has been confirmed in seabirds in East Lothian, adding to the increasing number of infected birds being reported along coastal areas. Conservationists say the situation is highly concerning. Our reporter Laura Piper sends this from North Berwick. 
Well, this has been the site where many sick and dying seabirds have washed up over the last week. Casualties of what has now been confirmed as avian flu. Now, we don't have official figures yet, but reports suggest that there could be well over a thousand seabirds that have died along our coastal areas, including Shetland, St Kilda and East Lothian. Today, staff from the Scottish Seaboard Centre says the impact has been devastating. Day by day the numbers are going up and it is very much a story that is going to unfold over the rest of the breeding season. Um, it still is largely gannets and uh, great skews which are affected in the north of Scotland but there are other species which are testing positive as well. Well wildlife charities have met with the Scottish Government to devise a plan of action. Now the chances of humans catching avian flu is very low. The advice if you come across a bird is not to touch it but to report it to DEFRA or your local council ranger. A lot of paper there. Now, lap dancers claim that closing Edinburgh's strip clubs will force the industry underground. The city's four venues will have to shut for good next year after the council agreed that they promote the sexual exploitation of women. But many of the dancers disagree, including mothers, nurses and social workers trying to boost their incomes. As campaigners prepare to mount legal challenges, Kay Nicholson has been speaking to people on either side of the debate. Dancers at Baby Dolls in Edinburgh have chosen this job for all sorts of reasons. Me being a full-time mum, obviously I've got the school run and then feeding the kids and that during the day. So ideally, they're in their bed, I'm not missing any time with my kids. I'm just getting my mum to babysit them and then I'm back for them even knowing where I... They didn't even know I've left. All the security, the girls, the support, it's brilliant being in here, to be honest. When I've actually seen both sides of it being on online and now coming into the club, I'd much prefer the club. I feel safer doing this than I did working hospitality. There's cameras everywhere, there's bouncers, there's other girls who will protect us. There's a lot of women that work with us that um, they are students or they're nurses or their social work, stuff like that, and they aren't getting paid enough. So they have to make up the wage difference by coming and doing stuff in. But within a year, working here may no longer be an option after the council voted to ban strip clubs in the city. If this club did have to close, what would you do? They're saying, oh, we want to protect the people who work here. We want to make sure they're safe. But by closing the clubs, they're doing the exact opposite. Everything will go underground. We know it will. Like, people will do private shows and that's where bad things can happen. Even if I didn't do it personally, I know people who might end up doing it. And it's terrifying to think that they could be put in that situation. Vivi's challenging counsellors on their decision. These women still need to make their money. They still need to work. They still need to provide for their families. And what they're doing is creating a scenario where they're going to, not only are they isolating us, but they are turning us into victims. They don't have, a, in my opinion, I don't think a legal leg to stand on. It's all, it's just moral, it's just morals, judgments. As it stands, all four of Edinburgh strip clubs will have to close by next April. Deputy Council Leader Mandy Watt says it's the right move. We have the the well-being of performers and you know women, um, aspects of equality. We have that in mind. I have a lot of admiration for them. You know, wanting to earn a living, wanting to help their families. So, in your view, then keeping this dialogue and this debate up is a positive thing. Well, let's have that conversation with the performers themselves about what their longer term aspirations are. The clubs have been given a year's notice. They're not closing tomorrow. So there's time. There's time. If they or their representatives come and talk to us about how we can help so that they can, you know, learn other skills to give themselves a, a future. The strip clubs say they are taking steps towards a judicial review. Meanwhile, unions are crowdfunding for legal action too. And the dancers have these messages for the council. It's just a job. We just come here in the evenings and then go home and go back to our families and go back to our normal lives. Don't speak for us. Come and speak to us so that we can let you know, so that you have a clear idea of who we are as human beings. And you can watch Kay's full report on Scotland tonight at 10.40. 
After a two-year absence, the Glasgow Taxi to Troon outing returned. The 75th edition of the trip saw around 300 children with additional support needs set off from Kelvin Way this morning to enjoy a day at the seaside. Ollie Dickinson joined them. A carnival of colour and cartoon characters on the Kelvin Way for the Glasgow Taxi trip to Troon. The 75th running of the event bringing smiles to the faces of everyone involved. Absolutely great, can't, can't beat it, you know, the sunshine's it made, just made that for everybody. You know, but I haven't seen them for three years, you know, you, you take them, the taxi drivers take them to school every day and bring them back, you know, but in this setting we've no, and they've been looking forward to it, we know, we've, we've spoke to the schools, or they're thoroughly looking forward to it. So. For two years the Covid pandemic meant the trip wasn't possible, but today it was back, bursting with fun. So now when you miss this day. You know, it's a fantastic day. It's good for us all, and it, you get a lifetime of memories out of it. It's amazing. It's a, it's a great cause, you know, and it's good for good for the kids to get them back on the, the day out in Troon. It's fantastic. What a great day with the weather as well. Brilliant. After a noisy departure, the convoy snaked its way through Glasgow with Shawland's pavements packed. before arriving in Troon for some well-earned refreshments. For the families on the trip, it's a special day. I don't think we can put into words just how, how happy and how appreciative we are of everything that everybody does and get into this day. No, no, we don't worry, don't we not? It's not a day for worrying. It's a day to be happy and huggle. Yeah. <laughs> I think the turnout speaks for itself in terms of how much everyone's missed this uh, over the past couple of years. Um, it's a great day, you know, we really look forward to it. Every time you come to Trun, it tears in your eyes as you approach. You just know what's, you, what to expect. It's just amazing. It is just amazing. The return of the outing has brought joy to so many families today. It's a date they're already looking forward to next year. Ollie Dickinson, STV News, Trun. Looks a great day. Now, here's Ronnie with the sport. Get your fill of the action. STV Sports, sponsored by Papa John's Pizza. Motherwell boss Graham Alexander says he's relishing the prospect of European football after they were drawn against Ballatown of Wales or Irish side Sligo Rovers in the UEFA Conference League. The first leg will take place at Fir Park on the 21st of July before the return leg a week later. The Steelmen enter in the second qualifying round, but Alexander admits he'd perhaps have liked a tie a little further away. I think I remember at the time, I think when we got there, I think I, was, I said I don't care as long as we're on a plane. And uh, it doesn't look like that way. So uh, we thought we could be on the bus or on a ferry. But um, but no, it's, it look, I think every, every team in, in that competition uh, has deserved their their place and their, their place in the draw, it'll be a comp there'll be competitive games. Now, Scotland's women's team will head to Poland to face Ukraine in a World Cup playoff next week, with head coach Pedro Martinez Losa stressing they must focus on the football. The tie was initially delayed due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but the Scotland boss says the match is crucial if they want to make it to the World Cup. In one part, obviously, we empathise with the situation that happened. We are happy that the game is, is being played finally. In the other side, we have a much bigger job to do for us, which is representing our country, qualifying for the World Cup. And that bigger job is, is much bigger than any other uh, consideration. So we are going to Poland to win. And finally, with a month to go until the 150th Open Championship tees off at St Andrews, preparations are continuing at the old course. This year's milestone anniversary is expected to attract record-breaking numbers with more than 52,000 people attending at the home of golf. We're very excited. We've been planning for this since the last putt in 2015, so it's been a long time in the making. It's the home of golf. We've got the best golfers in the world turning up to see who's going to be the champion golfer of the year at the 150th edition of it. I mean, that's exciting. And that's your sport tonight, folks. Get your fill of the action. STV Sports, sponsored by Papa John's Pizza. Now, Sean has the weather. Watch out for a sudden temperature drop.
Tui Blue Hotels. Sponsor STV Weather. So we are on the very edge of that extreme heat that's building across England in the next couple of days. Tomorrow, our temperatures peaking 20 to 21 where we've got the sunshine. Rather light today, but look at the southeast of England. Friday, 34. Now you might think, well, that happens all the time in England. But in actual fact, we've only achieved 34 and above on five occasions since 1961. Just shows you how exceptional that is and the possibility in parts of France over the next couple of days that temperatures could be peaking around 42 degrees in some way. Western areas. Now, we've held on to a lot of cloud in the far northwest, some shout out breaks of rain. Here we've been plagued by those little weather fronts that have been trailing in over the last couple of days. Lovely sunshine in the south and east, and temperatures here have been up to about 20 degrees. Now, there will be some shout out breaks of rain for many of us through the evening. That clears away, it becomes drier again across central and southern parts. So, tomorrow morning, a fine start to the day here. Once again, we've got the cloud, we've got the outbreaks of rain in the northwest, but we'll see scattered showers developing just about anywhere in to the afternoon, but warm in the sunshine, especially further east, highs up to 20 or 21 degrees Celsius, but a wet night to come tomorrow because we'll see heavy and persistent rain coming into the west that spreads eastwards across all parts tomorrow night. On Friday, it's a rather cloudy day and showery. Temperatures still around 20 degrees in some spots, cooler into the weekend, but mostly dry and bright. Tui Blue Hotels. Sponsor STV Weather. And that's all from us tonight. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. Bye-bye.